Hello my friends, welcome back. I'm JC and this is Grace Overflowing. In today's video, I want to share a few things that the Lord has put on my heart as I've been speaking in some of my most recent videos. I believe that the rapture is soon. And while I think that is an amazing thing, that is an awesome thing, the Lord has burdened my heart this week with the fact that just as the Pharisees were awaiting the Messiah and should have recognized him, they were the ones who in fact rejected him and sought to kill him. And just as that was true then, the same is true today. There are modern day Pharisees that are expecting rapture and they are expecting to be taken in the rapture. Now, I will say before I go into that, in more detail because I believe it's something we all need to prayerfully consider. We all need to pray that we are not like the Pharisees, that our eyes aren't blinded and our hearts haven't been hardened on any level. But what's interesting is that I have felt for a very long time that the Lord has shown me through my personal study that the reality is that the church in large is the opposite of what the Pharisees were. So in the beginning, you know, you had these Pharisees who were all ruly rulertons and, you know, puffing themselves up, creating rules, creating obstacles. You know, they wanted to look good and they were trying to be authoritarian and they wanted that position of power more than they wanted God and the truth of what his word really was. And therefore they didn't recognize the Messiah, nor did they want him because they didn't want anybody to steal their thunder and specifically a Messiah that came in riding a donkey. And so while we have that in the beginning, I believe that the reality of the church age is the polar opposite. You know, the Lord had burdened my heart with the fact that there is a lot within the church that it's all loosey-goosey, it's all tickly ears, whatever makes you feel good. We accept almost everything. We walk and talk just like the rest of the world. We accept the things that the world accepts. You know, this is spoken into in the book of Timothy. I believe it's 2 Timothy where it says, you know, in the last days, there will be people who have an illusion of godliness, but denying its power. And what that means is that there will be people who proclaim to be Christians that deny the power of God to change and Jesus to change. They will say, you know, Jesus allows you to walk in your sin or wallow, um, not Jesus once he comes inside your heart, he will transform you and he will lead you away from your sin. And if you are truly converted, if you truly love God, you will seek him where he can be found in his word. You will grow in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and that will change you. That is not the message that the church in large is actually giving. It is a let's make everybody feel good, motivational speech, kind of what can the gospel do for you? How can the gospel help you live your best life? And so that is just the very obvious but ironic truth. But having said that, there are some within the body that are falling in the Pharisees camp. Of course, we know that there would be. And what the Lord has really shown me and burdened me with is that these people are largely not only just believing in their hearts, but they're even speaking on YouTube and they're sharing their experiences on YouTube and their beliefs related to the Jabberwocky, related to the fact that if someone has taken this thing, there is eternal damnation. It is the final MOTB from which there is no coming back. And I had spoken into this subject at large. I had really sought the Lord on a lot of the troubling things about this current situation and why it is so troubling. And it is not to be taken as far as I'm concerned. I believe this was a test. And I believe by and large, the church had failed. We sought the work of man's hands, 100% an idol, but yet I do not believe that it's the final manifestation of the MOTV. And beyond that, even if it is that those people who are sharing this message should not be vocally proclaiming damnation over these people, nor should they mentally be doing that. So whether you have a YouTube channel and you're speaking these words to a group, whether you're an influencer or it's just you having been influenced and listened to some of these messages and believed it based on some of these very sinister things about this current problem 
you know, obviously it changes you and that is not a good thing. However, the power of God, the grace of God, as long as Jesus is still on the throne is greater. And I plan to prove to you today through a couple of very specific scriptures that if you are mentally believing this, and if you are vocally speaking this, that repentance is necessary. You know, I say this out of love. I say this as someone who is sharing, and I want you to pray over everything I say and not just take it or leave it based on what I say and what I believe. I ask you to take this to the Father and ask him to give you wisdom on it. But I think that it is very, very clear that anyone making these statements are in jeopardy of standing before the Lord on the last day and possibly even on the day of rapture and being left behind or possibly not even entering the kingdom themselves as that is what is reflected in the word of God. In Matthew 23, Jesus proceeds to give seven woes to the scribes and the Pharisees. In the first woe, the very first woe, he says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. And so I just want to say that obviously these people that are making these statements are shutting the door to heaven. They are standing in a position of judgment. They are making a decision on someone's eternal soul that they have no power nor authority to make. And it seems very obvious to me that there is a problem there, just according to this scripture, that you are pronouncing some kind of a damnation or eternal judgment over people. And thus, by doing it, you are therefore guilty yourself. And what's really interesting is that Matthew 23 has all of these warnings specific to the scribes and Pharisees. And what follows directly after is Matthew 24, where the Lord speaks to the signs of the ends of the age, which I believe is a warning to us all. Now, furthermore, what I really want to speak into is John chapter 12, verses 48 through 50, which says, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that this commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to point out about this verse, but the most important thing that I think I could say is the fact that while Jesus was 100% God while he was on this earth. He was here as the son acting on behalf of the father. He had all the power and authority of the father while in the flesh, he did not make any judgment on anybody's eternity. While in the flesh, he did not judge. He deferred and he said that he wouldn't, but the word would. And he also said when the word would. And that is the last day. And so the beginning of John speaks into the fact that Jesus is the word. And so what he was saying is that in that moment, he as a man wasn't going to make any judgments over anybody, but on the last day, he as God and the human manifestation of the word would judge. But it was very specific as to when the judgment would happen. And that is on the last day. And obviously, my friends, we are not Jesus. We have not been given the authority to make this kind of judgment ourselves, nor is it the last day. And therefore, I think that it is very clear that the word speaks that any such judgment is in fact judgment and puts anybody who is making these judgments in the Pharisees' boat. Furthermore, Romans 10, 6 speaks into the fact that we should not say who goes up and who goes down, meaning 
who goes to heaven and who doesn't. That is not our place. That is not our work. That is Jesus's work. That is his place. He is the only one who's truly capable of judging a heart. And therefore, I feel that regardless of someone's decision in that situation, we do not know the status of their heart following it. Is it very likely that it changes you to where you wouldn't have as much connection to the Holy Spirit? Is it possible to grieve the Holy Spirit? Can he live in uh, unrepentant sin? You know, we know the truth of it. And that is no. I mean, he cannot live in it. And yes, he can be grieved. And so we need to be working out our salvation with fear and trembling, just as the word of God says we should. But at the end of the day, no one knows what is in someone's heart other than Jesus. And until it's over, it's not over. And we as humans, as flesh, do not get to make that decision about our own reality, our own life even. So how can we make that decision and that proclamation over someone's eternity? Okay, now with all that said, I want to speak very briefly into the messages of the three angels found in Revelation 14. And I want to share with you what the Lord showed me this week that further proved to me that in fact, there's no way that the current Jabberwocky program could be the MOTV. There is something that's coming after that will be the final manifestation of it. And that is the fact that in the presence of two or more witnesses, a thing is established. So in the presence of two or three witnesses, a thing is established. This truth is woven all throughout the scriptures. And so we see that there are three angels and there are three separate messages. And what the Lord really showed me this week is that it seems very obvious that the way you read it, it's in order. The first message is that, you know, there's an eternal gospel and the angel is saying, fear God and give him the glory for the hour of judgment is at hand. Worship God and only him. And the second angel follows saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immortality. And then third, there's an angel who says, do not worship the beast, okay? And so it's obvious that since this is in numerical order, it seems that we could understand that before the mark of the beast is really happening on the level of what is described in the word of God, that Babylon would have fallen first. But there's many who want to say that these angels are spread out over time. And so it may not be that the second angel is speaking into the very specific vision of what we see in Revelation 18, that in one hour Babylon will fall. But I disagree, and I'll tell you why I disagree. And what the Lord really showed me this week is that in the presence of two or more witnesses, a thing is established. And what I really felt he was saying was that whether it be a microchip or whether it be something administered through a syringe, these things have been happening for decades. And for the true and final manifestation of the MOTB, something would have to be different. There would have to be evidence in some way beyond just the isolated thing. You know, is this world mystery Babylon? You know, has this world fallen? You know, is it falling? Yes. But what we see in Revelation 18, you know, the fire of her burning, you know, falling in one hour, those things have not yet happened. And the scriptural truth that something is established in the presence of two or more witnesses is very, very important because that is the backbone of the message connected to the mark of the beast. That is the example. That is the witness of the fact that the mark of the beast is now going to be in effect. And so clearly up to this point, there's been many needles. There's been many cures. There's been many things that have ultimately led up 
to this very sinister one. Don't get me wrong. It is different. And the Lord has woken many of us up to that fact. But until Jesus literally comes off of his throne and literally the grace period ends, the church age ends, until that happens, there is forgiveness for sins. And furthermore, it says in verse 13, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the spirit, for they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Well, it says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Well, what about those who were alive in the Lord? What happened to them? Where did they go? My friends, it is my understanding that they were raptured. And so that's why it's saying from this point forward, when this message, you know, the messages of these angels, which by the way, I believe is the message of the 144,000 that are going to be sent out in pairs of two by two, just like the 72 in the book of Luke. They are going to be giving this message at the time when Babylon falls, the rapture has happened. And so those are the two witnesses to the mark of the beast. Do you see Babylon? It has fallen. No one thought she could fall, which is America. And do you see where these people have disappeared? You know, it wasn't an alien. It was the rapture of the church. So it's important that there are these other things at the time when the mark of the beast goes into effect in order to make it truth. And so I hope this helps anybody who is wrestling with some of this, even as it relates to friends and family and co-workers. The Bible says that life is in the blood, but that's the physical life, and that is flesh. And what is of the Spirit cannot be changed by the enemy. The Word of God says that Jesus doesn't lose one single soul. Whoever was his will be his, and the gates of the hell will not prevail over the church. And so I believe that there is still hope and I believe that we can still pray for these people. And I believe that there can be an awakening. And I do believe that at the time of rapture and possibly even before when things really start to go down before rapture, possibly, you know, many will be awakened. You know, we are spiritual people in a physical world. And unfortunately, many within the Christian churches are very physically driven. They're very focused on the physical world and their physical hopes and their physical dreams. And their hearts are really not set, you know, on the reality of the truth that is the spiritual life and the truth that what is of the spirit is eternal. And that should be the most important thing to all of us. So with that, my friends, I hope this was an encouragement to you and I appreciate you listening until next time. May the Lord bless you and guide you and fill you with his perfect grace overflowing.